And uh, this evening's talk uh, comes as a experience just during the week when I was told that somebody was going around saying that you cannot know for sure. You cannot know whether there's such a thing as rebirth or just one life. You cannot know for sure karma. You cannot know anything for sure. And of course, straight away I thought, how can you know that for sure? <laughs> and the point being is that in our modern life that we are exposed not just to many different types of soap powder, not to many different channels on the TV, but also to many different religions and many different truths which are on the supermarket of our religious life. And sometimes you ask, that Ajahn Brahmi comes up here every Friday evening, does he really know? And how can you know? And what else actually is knowing? Can you know anything? And the point is that the whole essence of Buddhism is, yes, you can know. You can know for yourselves. There is a way of finding out for yourself, so you don't need to believe in others. One of the strengths of Buddhism, which I, made me interested in my early years, is you don't need to believe. But neither are you left to your own devices just to... Uh, struggle with the different types of ideas which are current in the world. For you're given guidance, guidance to find out for yourself, to find out what knowledge is. And so the talk this evening is not what to know, but how to know. How to know for sure. How to know truth for yourself. How to know whether Buddhism is the right religion or the church next door is the one to go to, how to know. Some people go to every church just to make sure. <laughs> like betting on every horse in the Melbourne Cup, you're bound to win. But you all know that if you bet on every horse, the only person who wins is the person who owns the betting shop. Now, here I'm talking about how to know for sure. And in classical Buddhism... The Buddha was actually showing how you don't know, why people don't know, what the causes of getting it wrong are. And this is a classical Buddhist teaching of the five hindrances. These are the five causes of not knowing clearly what's going on. The, the five roots of delusion. What keeps delusion going? He's called his five hindrances. And in brief, those five hindrances are desire, ill will, sort of sloth, and restlessness, and lastly, doubt. And this is what I'm going to go through during this uh, talk this evening, going through it in detail, putting it into daily life. And the first is like desire, wanting. Our problem is that we would only want to experience what we like, what we want to experience. And because of wanting, because of desire, we always tend to bend the truth to suit ourselves. And so for a lot of people in the world, we don't actually face up to truth. We don't know what's out there. We only know what we want to see, what we want to believe. And this is the first hindrance to true knowledge. To overcome that hindrance, we have to let go of all wanting. To see things as they truly are, not what we want to see. Now listen about wanting. All those things which we don't like, we block out from our life. We want to be rich. We want to have this beautiful partner in life. We want things which we know we could never have but we still want them. One of my stories, which I keep on repeating, is a story of romance. When people go romancing, where do they come? They don't come to the Buddhist Society of West Australia on a Friday night. That's the last place they come to if they want to fall in love. But where they go to is the candlelit restaurants. They go on the out in the moonlight. They go to nightclubs where the lights are turned down, anywhere where they can't really see what they're going out with. 
<laughs> and it's so true, isn't it? Now, why do people do that? The, re- the reason, the reason they do that is because when you can't really see your partner, it means wanting, wishful thinking, can make your partner look like this supermodel. They can look like this film star. And they do look like that in the moonlight. Now, is that truth? Is that really knowing things the way they truly are? And you can see that this just bends perception to see what we want to see. It's the same with the advertisements. If you go into the supermarket or the shopping mall, there's bright colours in there. Why do we have that? Because... It just perverts our perception. And we think that what's so brightly coloured must be good, must be wonderful. And we buy it. It's what we want to believe. That's the problem. So much of advertising is actually turning you because of the clothes you wear into this beautiful, attractive woman. Because of the sharp suit or the big car to make you irresistible to the opposite gender. One of the other stories which I tell from my youth, when I used to buy into all of this, because there was an advertisement I saw on the television, and the advertisement was for St. Bruno tobacco. This was the days when we didn't know that tobacco was a cause for cancer. And this was tobacco you smoked in a pipe. And as a young, this was 18, 19 year old, it looked so cool to put some tobacco in a sort of a piece of wood and set fire to it. <laughs> Basically what you were doing. <laughs> and in this advertisement, this man, who wasn't particularly good looking, he put some, some Bruno tobacco in his pipe. He lit it and he was just walking down the road. And in the advertisement, these amazingly beautiful girls would actually stop what they were doing They'll be walking behind a counter in the bank. They'd leap over the counter, entranced by the aroma of this tobacco, and follow this man. And they would just leap out of their cars. They would get outside of the shops, and they'd just follow this man. And after a, a few minutes, because not even less than that, it was only a 30-second commercial, this man had all these beautiful women following him because of this aroma of this Sabuna tobacco. Stupid, wasn't it? The guests who brought some St. Bruno tobacco the next day. <laughs> but it never worked for me. <laughs> it doesn't work for anybody. It's just the other. But why do we do that? A lot of it because you wanted it to work. You wanted it to happen. It's all the wanting. It was obvious that it wouldn't be true. Anyone in their right mind wouldn't do things like that. But why did you do that? Because you want it to... You want to be attractive. You want to to have those uh, relationships. You're denying the truth of things. That's why we don't know for sure whenever we've got desire there. It's like that story I told two or three weeks ago when I asked people, how many people in this room, how many people in this room think that they are above average intelligence? Everyone does. (laughs) And it can't be the case because half of you must be below average intelligence. (laughs) But it's not you, is it? It's the person sitting next to you, isn't it? That's not me. You can see how wishful thinking bends the truth. We all think we are better than we really are. And this is actually not facing up to the truth. For those of you who start a relationship, why is it in relationship there's so many problems? Because there's so many likes and dislikes involved in there. What we want to believe, what we want to have happen there in that relationship. Because of the wanting, we very rarely see what's really happening there. We rarely see the truth of what's going on. What we want to believe is usually what we see. And on the opposite, the second hindrance is of ill will, denial. What we don't want to see, what is anathema to us, we just block out from our consciousness. Now this is why we don't see things as they really are. 
It is why we we bend the truth to suit us. It is why there are so many different philosophies and religions, and why everybody says, I know, I see, I've experienced these things. The point is, we only experience what we want to see, and we block out what we can't see. That is not being wise. That's not being truthful. To be truthful, to have real knowledge, we have to suspend all of our likes and dislikes, what we want and what we don't want, to be able to see truth, whether that's the truth of your relationship, to be honest to how it's occurring in this moment and what's really happening. Not having some fantasy idea of, you know, this is the one for me, this is a relationship which is going to last forever. Not having this fantasy that everything is right and perfect. But also not being in denial to the problems which are really there, which you can see if you only look carefully. But being truthful has to be giving up all your likes and dislikes, what you want to happen. And if you can do that, if you can be honest to your relationship, in other words, seeing the faults, accepting the faults, and not wanting it to be different, but this is a relationship, then in that honesty, at least you know what's going on. You've got the truth of the situation there, and you can do something about it. It's like the relationship we have to our own bodies. Again, we live in a lot of denial, a lot of wishful thinking to your body. This is why that whenever there's that little pain in the body, we sort of sometimes say, oh, this is all right, nothing wrong with me. And it might be something serious. It might be something which is worth checking up. It might be the heart attack. It might be the cancer starting. But a lot of times when you talk like that, do you want to face up to that? There's a lot of wanting and a lot of denial in the way we look at our bodies. And because of that, the body usually gives us many, many signs. Many signs that the body is in stress, that things are going wrong. But what do we really do? We don't want to see that. We want our body to be healthy. We want our body to be fit. We want our body to live a long, long time. How many of you are prepared to die tonight? One day it's going to happen to you. But are you ready yet? How many people actually believe they are going to die tonight? We all believe we're going to die tomorrow, next year, some other time, any other time. But the only time people die is now. It's the only time you have. So the point is, we're in denial about this. If we can actually face these things with the truth of them, instead of having the the likes and dislikes to face up to life then at least we can actually be sensitive and mindful to our bodies. This mindfulness, which is a very, very powerful part of Buddhism, is like awareness, alertness to the present moment, to its truth, without trying to bend it, to filter it, to fit what we want to see. Some years ago, there's a very significant experiment which was done at Harvard. The experiment uh, entailed a group of students going into a theatre on which was flashed a, a, a series of images on the screen. The images were flashed so quickly that the first time that no student could really understand what was being projected onto the screen. And the experimenters increased the time of exposure incrementally until the flash gave some of the students an idea, a rough idea, of what was being shown on the screen. It was an experiment in perception on how long an exposure you need to gain the information required to guess what that image truly was. Now the point of the problem was, what they found, was that once you fix an idea of what you saw there, and the particular um, exposure was 
the stairs leading up to one of the lecture theatres, which every student on campus would have known. It was flashed up so quickly that one student thought it was a ship on the sea. They didn't have enough information to actually form a big picture, but the mind leapt to the conclusion it was a ship on the ocean. As the time of exposure was increased, the person still continued to hold on to the idea it was a ship on the ocean. Even though anybody, if they'd seen that exposure for the first time, it was long enough, they'd have seen, they'd have recognised that it was really the stairs leading up to a lecture theatre. He showed that sometimes how we hold on to views, when the evidence should be strong enough to show that we're wrong. The reason why we hold on to those views is because of desire. Wanting to be right. Coming from the sense of self and ego. Few people admit they're wrong. Have you ever been wrong? Somebody asked that question and said, yeah, the only time I was wrong was many years ago when I thought I was wrong. (laughs) Why is it that people find it hard to admit they're wrong? And the reason is, is because the sense of like self and the sense of self, the sense of me, the ego, is what creates this desire and wanting business. When we have the wanting, we actually bend the truth. Even though it's quite clear that we're wrong, that we should believe in something else, we still won't do that because we've invested so much time, so much of ourselves, that it's embarrassing to admit that we're wrong. Ajahn Chah was great in just teasing our disciples because one day a Christian came to try and convert my teacher Ajahn Chah. And they came into his hut and after he left, Ajahn Chah turned round to us and said, perhaps they're right and I'm wrong. Ah! <laughs> All he was doing is teasing us, how do you know who's right and who's wrong? So you have to put aside all of your wants and all of your don't wants to be able to see truth, to be able to put aside your reputation, to put aside who you think you are in order to see the truth. That's part of desire. That's why that one of the problems with science Even science is dogmatic, because one of the sayings I learned when I was a student was the eminence of a great scientist is measured by the length of time they obstruct progress in their field. And it's true, because if you're an expert, then it's hard to admit that you're wrong. And because it's hard to admit that you're wrong, because you're the expert, that bend the truth because again of desire and that's a great scientist are you an expert in what fields of endeavor are you the expert and how often is it because we think we're an expert we will never admit we're wrong therefore we will not know the truth we will bend the truth to suit our ego So selflessness has to be there to actually to see the truth. And that selflessness and that desire to actually to continue that experiment which was done at Harvard. There was another scene which was flashed on the screen very, very quickly at first. And the time of exposure extended, extended, extended. But it was the image which most people took the longest to actually to discern correctly. And it was the image of two dogs copulating. The reason why it took the longest is because it was an image they did not want to see. When you don't want to see it, you block it out longer, 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 until it's right in your face, as it were, and then you see. It's what is called denial. Again from wanting, but this time not wanting, the ill will which bends the truth. We don't see what we don't want to see. 
one of the problems of our life, why we're not mindful, or not alert to the problems in life, because we don't want to face up to it. We don't want to face up to the fact we're aging. When I was teaching a Dharma school for children some years ago, I asked them a question. Because we were talking about many things, and we're talking about old age. I said to the kids, they were maybe about 10, 11 years of age, say, what is old? How many years? You know, give me a figure. What's an old person? And they said, maybe 35. And I said, no, that's going too much. Maybe 30, that's old. <laughs> and I said to them, hang on, I'm 40. And I was very old to them. But I was in denial. <laughs> I never thought I was old. Are you old? What's your age now? And you really think that, what's the life expectancy now? Is it 74, 75? 80s now. Are you sure that's not wishful thinking? <laughs> okay, all of those, if it's 85, all of those who are over 42 and a half, you're more than halfway there. You're closer to death than to your birth. Do you really think like that? We don't think like that because we don't want to. That's our problem. We're not knowing truthful truths because we don't want to see it. Now, to actually to find out that truth, we have to overcome all desires and all ill will to face truth. It takes courage to do that. And it also takes tricks to do that. Have you noticed that the way in Buddhism where people become enlightened is always through meditation? Somebody asked the other day, can you become enlightened just through study? No way can you become enlightened through study, because study does not overcome your likes and dislikes. It doesn't stop you bending the truth. Do you become enlightened through listening to talks? No. Why? Because that doesn't stop you um, restraining your likes and dislikes. In which way do you stop your likes and dislikes? When you are meditating letting go, not wanting, contentment. That's what this meditation is always teaching you, to let go of the desires and ill will to face the truth of the present moment as it is. When you were meditating, could you stay in the present moment and just allow it to be? If not, why? A lot of times it's because we wanted something. We wanted to be somewhere else. We wanted to get this over with so we can listen to the talk. Get the talk over with so we can have a cup of tea or those cakes which I saw in the <laughs> in the reception area. I always wanted to, to, you know, one of the worst experiences I had as a monk here in Perth was one day when we were, this is in our former centre in Magnolia Street, in a small house, two rooms in the front, two rooms in the back, and we were raising money for our, monastery. We hadn't bought the monastery yet. We were raising money. And someone had the bright idea to have a cake store. Which is a good idea to raise money to, for the monastery. But the problem was that myself and the other monk had to live in that house. And all these people brought cakes on the Friday evening. They had 30 or 40 cakes freshly baked. And they were going to be sold the following morning. So they put them in the kitchen overnight. And I was right next to my room. And being a monk, I couldn't touch those cakes. But my goodness, I could smell them all night. <laughs> oh, that was one of the worst nights I'd ever had as a monk. <laughs> like all those delicious cakes and not being able to taste one of them. But anyway, so that all this, <laughs> all this wishful thinking, which we have, it actually makes things, just on that, on, the, on like desires, for years as a monk... I started to think of like in the English dish of fish and chips when I was in, in Thailand for seven years. And then finally, I think it was only when I first came here to Australia, someone gave me fish and chips, like the dream come true. I wish it had never come true, because in my dreams it tasted much more delicious <laughs> than actually in my mouth. Isn't that the case? See, it's a wishful thinking. It's not the truth. It's what you want it to be. 
That's the problem. Actually, he gave me a stomachache. I remember that <laughs> afterwards. And it is, if we're going to actually to see the truth, we have to let go of those desires. And this is what meditation does. This is why in Buddhism we teach meditation not just to get peaceful, but in order to see things the way they truly are, to come to truth. We meditate in order to know for sure not what we want to see, not what we don't like to see, but to see what's really there. Because when you let go in a moment, no thinking, because it's thinking is when we start bending things. I don't want this, I want that. We start to make up the reality through thoughts. Here we're seeing things as they really are. Is which is why when you start to develop the peace of mind through meditation, that peace reoccurs throughout your day. And every now and again you start to be alert and wise to your body, to your relationship, to life. You are knowing without wanting. Further, you're knowing even more deeply through staying with something long enough to see it clearly. There's an experience which I tell in meditation retreats of the and my meditation on a Saturday afternoon, which some of you come to, which was a powerful experience of the road up to my monastery, which I've been going up many, many years up and down that road in a car. First time I walked up that monastery, it looked completely different. You try that in the street where you live. Walk along that street. I was telling this to one of our visitors who was just visiting from Singapore, and he agreed with me. He'd been living in this street in Singapore for so long. He'd always get in his car to go to work and in his car to go back again. One day he walked along that street, same like the first time I walked up the hill up to Serpentine Monastery, and he couldn't understand at first why that street looked so different, why he saw so many more things, why he could actually pick up much more detail than he'd ever seen before. When I was walking up my hillside, up to the monastery at Serpentine, I stopped. When I stopped, I saw even more detail. When I reflected on what was going on, why do things look different when you slow down? I started remembering the Buddha's teachings about letting go of restlessness. The restlessness of the mind is third hindrance, is when the mind moves too quickly. It can't stay on one thing long enough, to the point that it never really understands what is going on, because it never stays with anything long enough to find out. Life for many people is as if viewing things through the window of a speeding car. You have to deal with so many things in quick succession, you don't have time to really know what is going on. Life is a blur. Experience are just shadows. Life has no depth, because we go too fast. The person you live with do you really know them? Or do we always pass so quickly by each other, never really spending enough time, real time of just being, so we can really know? Let alone a person, how can you know yourself, know your body, know your mind? The only way you can know those things is to be still long enough to see deeply into their nature. Just like going up and down that hill or that Singaporean going in a car up and down his road. You can never really know that road when you're passing it too quickly. But if you walk and then stop, you see a completely different scene. And it was amazing just how different that was. When you walk slowly or even stop, the senses have got all the time in the world to actually to pick up all the detail to actually to know it fully. And the amazing thing is that when you slow down, that life becomes very beautiful. The hillsides 
as you reveal their beauty, the slower you go. That's where you start seeing into the truth of things. You can't know by going fast. You can only know by stopping, by being still. And that is why that we meditate to stop. However, sometimes when people slow down and stop, sometimes they start snoring. <laughs> because they don't know how to be alert and stop. It takes, again, some skill to be able to deal with something and allow the mind to play with it long enough rather than allowing the mind just to turn off into sloth, into tiredness. Because of our life, is moved so fast. Because when we see TVs, the images move so quickly. I remember the first time I saw a television, again, after about seven or eight years as a monk in Thailand, I went to visit England, and in a house in Scotland, I saw a television for the first time in eight or nine years. It gave me a headache. The reason we did, because the images were going so fast. I couldn't believe that, you know, how could anyone make sense of all of that? Because I was used to the forests of northeast Thailand. And in the forests, you know, the trees only sway slowly. And that's the fastest thing which you see. And the, the TV was just moving so quickly. Because people have been trained to see things move quickly, to act quickly, it's hard for us to do things slowly, to slow down even to stop. We're habitual movers. And because we're in the habit of always moving on to the next thing, we've forgotten how to stop. That's why when you do stop, life becomes very different. It's only when stopping can one really see truth. But stopping with alertness, with awareness. Usually the only time we stop is actually to go to sleep in our life. It's even interesting when people come to the red traffic lights. The red traffic lights are the greatest Buddhist symbol we have in the Western world. Forget about Buddha statues, forget about temples, forget about these stupas, these chadias, or these flags. The best Buddhist symbol we have in the West is the red traffic lights. It's always saying, stop. They're beautiful things. We should have more of them. <laughs> You see, you're in denial again. And the reason is because they stop you. You can't go anywhere. But when, the red, when your car gets caught in a red traffic light, the car stops. But do you stop? This is our problem. We don't stop. That's the problem. It's not the red traffic light. It's not the car. It's because you've forgotten how to stop and just to enjoy just resting by the red traffic lights of life. There are moments when you have to stop. The moments when you should really just relax. When life stops and you have an opportunity just to have a look around and see where you are. Rather, always be concerned with where you're going. Truth, knowing, is knowing where you are, not knowing where you're going. How can you know where you're going? when no one knows where they are. So this is where we stop that restlessness, and we get used to stopping. When a person first starts meditating, they start always getting sleepy. Sleepiness is one of the first uh, parts of meditating, but I always tell people that's a hindrance, that's a problem which is very easily sort of overcome. It's not a big problem. Sometimes it was a big problem there. I can remember once teaching in a jail. It was actually, in those days, it was Canning Vale Jail. I've changed the name now. I forget what it's called now, but it used to be Canning Vale Jail. It was a high-security jail. And because of the high-security jail, it had some very, very bad prisoners in there, very dangerous. I had to have a prison officer with me at all times. So the prison officer had to come into my meditation group. And as I was teaching the meditation had all the prisoners meditating, just watching their breath, getting so quiet. And the prisoner, prison officer was in the room as well. And that's when I started hearing 
somebody snoring. And I, luckily I opened my eyes because as a prison officer, he was the one who was snoring. He'd fallen asleep. But when I opened my eyes, the prisoners, they weren't meditating anymore. They'd heard him snoring. And they weren't looking at me. They weren't looking at their breath. Well, they were looking at his keys. <laughs> And once they saw me over their eyes, they looked at me, they looked at his keys, they looked back at me again. And they told me afterwards, it was a very, very close thing. <laughs> it was only because they respected me, knew I'd get in trouble if they'd have taken the keys. <laughs> but the prison officer had fallen asleep. <laughs> so there are some dangers sometimes in falling asleep, but other times there's no real dangers, and it's just a matter of learning how to be alert without moving. A lot of people only know how to be alert when they're moving. Just learn how to be alert when you're still. And that's how you really know. By stopping and opening your mind and really seeing. And the last thing that hindrance is this doubt. Because when you're doubting, you're actually not allowing the data to really teach you. You're second-guessing the data too quickly. In any experiment... A good scientist will actually allow all the data to come in, first of all. And then, only when all the data is in, and then you collate the data, you work it all out. But too often we doubt. Which, in other words, we interfere with the collection of data before it's really time. That's why, in every meditation, which I teach here, we only start to investigate at the end of the meditation. How do you feel? What's peace? What's joy? What is freedom? How do you know what those terms truly mean? Wouldn't it be wonderful to know for sure what peace is? How many people know peace? How many people know freedom? How many people know joy? Hardly anybody. That's why people suffer so much in the world. Well, they go through life hardly any wiser than when they started. Well, they always have problems in life, problems in relationships, problems in health, problems in just getting by because we don't know. Which is why in Buddhism we teach meditation. We teach it as the core. We encourage it as a way of knowing, as a way of overcoming these five hindrances of desire, ill will, sort of restlessness, which means you don't stay long enough with anything to really know it properly, like going through the, in the car, looking through a window, being fully awake to what's happening, and not questioning until the end. If we can do that, then we find we know. Mindfulness, this word which is used in Buddhism, becomes real mindfulness, empowered mindfulness, only when those five obstacles are overcome. If there's still some desire, ill will, restlessness, sloth, tiredness and doubt, then mindfulness will never see things as it truly are. They only see what you want to see. Well, you'll block out what you don't want to see. That's why we teach, if you want to find out whether there's such a thing as rebirth and reincarnation, don't try and second-guess this. Don't come into the experiment trying to prove one thing or another. Keep that open mind. No desire, no ill will, no restlessness, no tiredness, no doubt. Just ask the question. And look. Look without any vested interest in what you're going to find. Look without any type of ego about being proved right or proved wrong. Look. And then you know. You don't look outside, you look inside. It becomes very clear when you are a meditator. When you look clearly, when you stop your car. And you look very clearly. Of what's actually happening, or who you are. 
It becomes so obvious you are not this body of yours. You're not a girl or a boy. You're not old, you're not young. The people in here, you know, boys 11 or 12, old people 70 or 80, or even older, are you that body? You know you're not that body. That's very obvious, but we keep on missing that. You're not sort of your nationality. Last week, there was the World Cup rugby. I was in a very fortunate position because I've got dual nationality. English, Australian. So I waited to find out who won first of all. Then I supported that team. Isn't that wisdom? <laughs> that way you could be happy. <laughs> now, but am I English? No. Am I Australian? No. You're just a monk. Am I a monk keeper? No, that's just the robes on the outside. Who are you? Now, if you look and ask that question and stop with all the vested interests and who you think you are, who you want to be, then, of course, after a while, you start to see who you are. There's an old experiment, uh, object lesson, which I do very often in retreats. I hold up something, usually this thing over here, and I ask people, what is this? If you haven't seen, seen this experiment before, you can do it right now. What is this? Somebody says it's a stick. Somebody says it's got cloth on the on the top. Someone says it's cylindrical. But what else is it? Keep on looking. Let go of desire, ill will. Let go of ego. Let go of restlessness. And allow the mind just to stop. And see. Let go of doubt of all this. What's he doing this for? What am I supposed to be doing? What's the point of all this? Let go of all those hindrances, those obstacles to truth. And you'll find the longer you look, the more you see, the deeper you see. And after a while, you see deeply in to this little object which I'm holding here. And it's much, much more than a gong bonger. And if you can look at your partner in life like this, they're not just you know, that old person you think you know. You look, and after the longer you look, the more you see, the deeper you see. You understand what knowing really is. Put aside your partner and look at yourself. Who is this being you think you know? Do you really know yourself? Stop and keep on looking. After a while, just like looking at the gong bonga. It's not just a man, it's not just a woman, it's not just this age, it's not just a Buddhist, a Catholic or whatever. You go far deeper than that. You go to the inner person, the mind. It should become pretty clear if you put aside all your vested interest, this being in here is much older than 20, 30, 40, 60, 80 years. The truth of rebirth should be very clear. And the truth of karma, your actions, why this happens to you, why you are here, why you have this happiness and that problem, should become quite plain if you just allow the mind to sink in to yourself. And the most important thing, happiness. What is happiness? Someone said, to ask me before I came in here, do you agree with the Dalai Lama's statement that the ultimate purpose of life is happiness? And I said, yeah, that's very accurate. What is happiness? Put happiness up in front of you like the gong bonger and allow the mind to stay, to stop with happiness and find out what it truly is. With joy, with freedom. Freedom is a beautiful word. Freedom is something which we all think we have, but only few truly possess. Are you free? The answer is no. You are in the power 
of your passions. You are controlled by your cravings. You are in the possession of your body so much we are afraid of death. Are you really free? There are two freedoms in the world, said the Buddha. The freedom of desire, which is the only freedom most people know. The freedom to come and go wherever you will. The freedom to watch whatever TV program you want, which is why we have one TV and more for every person in the house these days. So you can always watch what we want to watch. That's called the freedom of desire. But the real freedom, the Buddha pointed out, if you look at yourself, look at freedom and go into it. The real freedom is the freedom from desire. You're free from these desires, from the cravings which push and pull us throughout our life. So if you see some ice cream, you can take it or not take it. That you are in control rather than the ice cream being in control. You can look at that cake in the reception area and you can take it or not take it. Instead of the cake being in control, you are in control. You see that beautiful girl or beautiful man. You are free. You see the hundred dollar note. You are free. It's only a piece of paper. That's all it is. Are you free with the desire for money? If I gave you a million dollars to become a nun, become a monk, would you take it? Certainly. <laughs> so you put a hand up in the back. <laughs> I should add that monks and nuns are not allowed to have money, so it doesn't count anyway. <laughs> are you free? Many years ago, one of our monks, he was a Canadian monk, he's still a monk today, over in Thailand. His parents were multimillionaires, and they came to see him in Thailand with a check for one million US, written out in his name. They'd give it to him if he disrobed. He left the monkhood. That must have been about 25 years ago, when a million dollars was worth much more than it is these days. He said no. He'd rather be a monk and have nothing than have a million dollars US. He was free from money, from the desire for money. It's a freedom from desires. What a wonderful freedom that is. Freedom from possessions. It's possession possess us. It's not we possess the possessions. So when we see truth, knowledge, we can see this for ourselves. When we give up desire and ill will, when we give up restlessness and, and this dullness of the mind, we give up doubt and allow things to reveal their truth to us. That's what we call knowledge. Real knowledge. We see it for ourselves and all these things which bend the truth are removed. That is what you can trust. That is why Buddhists meditate, to abandon those hindrances, to be still so we can truly see. And when we see, that's called enlightenment. Enlightenment has come stage by stage, incrementally, as you start to see the truth of things. You do become one who knows for yourself. You don't become one who believes you become one who knows. So you can know. And that's how you know. For yourself, you can find out everything which the Buddha found. The Buddha once said, the truth is not to be found in the words of a Buddha. They're not to be found in the books. They're not to be found in the, the talks. The truth is to be found, he said, in this fathom-long body of yours be found within you. That's how we know. And all people who give talks are just telling you how to find out. So that's about what knowledge is. We don't argue, we look when the five hindrances are overcome. So, hope you know.
<laughs> so, is there any questions or comments about knowing? Yes, go on. Okay, that particular doubt is saying it's another part of doubt which is important, and that is actually questioning many things like questioning our possessions, questioning whether we need to own all this stuff. Questioning, in that sense, is uh, not uh, always asking the question again and again and again and again and again, which is like interrupting the data search, but putting aside all assumptions before we begin. Because we start our, our investigation of life with so many assumptions, so many sort of vested interests, so many things we expect to see. And here, so to find truth, we've got to put aside everything. This is actually really the job, not sort of, of overcoming doubt. By doubt here, it means always interrupting the investigation with more and more questions, sort of as you're going along the path of stopping the mind, of stilling the mind, of coming to... Yes, you have to begin with the doubt, with the doubting the delusion, doubting you know, what you've been taught, doubting... Uh, your uh, original view of the world. This is actually like science. Always actually just to uh, put aside everything you've taught, been taught, everything you've learned, everything you want to believe. Because we always go into well, our relationships with our body, relationships with others, relationships to life. There's so much baggage. We're going to put aside that baggage first of all. I think that's what you're asking, isn't it? Which is actually one of one of the great things. That, sorry. Ha ha. Well, this is again. Uh, you're saying the mind always says takes upon uh, itself. This is my problem. This is the, and that is actually that is the big problem where we have the ownership, coming again from the sense of self. One of the big questions of all uh, philosophy, religion of life, is like, who am I? And again, that is carrying baggage. Who am I is assuming that one is something when trying to find out who that is. And that again is the wrong question. The question is like, am I or what is this thing I take to be me? Now, if you ask the right question, actually you're expanding the investigation so there's no baggage at all inside there, and it's a true investigation. So you look upon this thing, which you take to be Lawrence, without any assumptions at all. And you put all those, what you expect to find, what you don't expect to find, away. It's actually to find out who this person is. And you've got to take up this thing you take to be Lawrence, and put it in front of you long enough in stillness to actually see what it truly is. And when you see there's no one really in there, there's no being which can own anything, there one gives up this ownership of things. And it's the ownership which creates all the problems, the ownership of my ideas, of my reputation, of my property. And of course, one of the things we most of us think we own is our body. Do you own your body? Are you willing to sort of give your organs to other beings who need them at your death? And to give your liver, your uh, what other parts of your body you want? One of the I'm hoping because I suffer from hay fever. I'm awfully hoping one day someone offer me a nose have a nose transplant, it'd be very, very useful, get liver transplants. But what I'd really like was like an Aboriginal nose. Because it'd be nice having a black nose in front of a white face. It would be my commitment to sort of multiracialism. <laughs> the, point, the, point, the point is there, that why is it that sometimes people, they, they feel um, reticent about, say, giving their organs? to um, somebody else when they're about to die why they're not organ donors it's because they think that's my organ I can't give it away it's as if it's like yours and it's that their ownership creates the problems 
And when you'd realize you just, this body is not yours, it's just you're renting it, you're looking after it for a while, it belongs to nature, then you're quite willing to give it back to nature. You're willing to let it go. When your possessions, you realize you don't really own anything, it belongs to others, you don't get so upset when the burglar comes and teaches you Dhamma, that it's not yours. <laughs> <laughs> or when somebody dies and again the burglar of death comes and takes away somebody and you realise it wasn't yours anyway there's always a time it's a problem we think it's our children now you've got children are they really yours? do they belong to you? <laughs> there you are, proven. If they belong to you, they'd be able to do what you want. And even actually, some they'll go off. You know, all you mothers and fathers, you have your children, and you look after them for so many years, and they go off to other parts of the country, other parts of the earth. We don't own them. They come into our lives for a certain time. We look after them, and then we have to let them go. Otherwise, you'll suffer for the rest of your life. Trying to own something which you can never own. Trying to control something which belongs to nature, not to you. So that's the truth, the things. People should be like birds. When the birds have their young, when the young are old enough to fly, the birds kick them out of the nest. And they never sort of, you know, do any more than that. They just birds go and fly away and the young look after themselves. Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> and some of you say, no, because I like my son and daughter at home. It's attachment. Anyway, I don't know, did I ask you a question or was it another talk? <laughs> Any other question? Yeah, one more. Yeah, go on. How do you overcome restlessness? It's going to understand that restlessness is always running away from the present moment, always wanting something else. Restlessness is a different type of wanting, a different type of ill will. I wonder why do we move so much? Why do we always rush around so much? Because we're not happy where we are. Why is it we buy a house, we decorate it, have a nice garden, as soon as we get a weekend, we go somewhere else. We go down Dunsmore, we go up north. As soon as we have a holiday, we go off to Singapore, we go off to Bali or whatever. Why is it, Why can't we just stay put? You put all that money into your house and make it so comfortable. Why don't we stay there, save a lot of money? Because we're restless. Why is it we get a good job? We want to sort of get another job. We have a nice partner. We want another partner. Restless. <laughs> we have a nice life and then we want another life afterwards. Restless. Because you can see it's, we're afraid. We're afraid to stop moving. A lot of it is fear. And the fear of just stopping. We're afraid what we might find when we stop running away. That's why the... I always give that the simile of like a ghost being chased by a ghost. People are afraid of ghosts. But you know that ghosts are afraid of monks. Because we know them. And so as soon as, you know, the, the ghost is chasing you, if you just turn around and say boo to the ghost, then the ghost runs away. And it's like, like the, the fear. What are we running away from? The ghosts. These phantoms. We turn around and say boo to that phantom of fear, and fear disappears, and then we can stop. Okay, I don't know if that answered your question, but that's enough now, because it's gone past the time, we're not giving you, give you overtime this evening. We're on work to rule today. <laughs>